Greetings to members or prospective members of the John Birch Society or to other friends, wherever you may be. If, as will normally be the case, you have just seen our introductory film presenting the achievements of American industry through the inspiring example of the Allen Bradley Company, then this is a repetition of our greetings, but they are just as sincere as before. And your kindness in giving up your time to let me talk to you in this way is now doubly appreciated. So I'll not waste any of that time in getting started, especially as I have some very serious matters to put before you. Also, I certainly am not seeking any garlands of popularity in this speech, for throughout all history, the bearer of bad news has been a most unpopular person. And I am now spending my whole life spreading bad news every day, everywhere that I can. But the man who was to me the most profound of all Americans, Ralph Waldo Emerson, once said that every mind must make its choice between truth and repose. It could not have both. Today you have left your choice somewhat in my hands, and I'm not only bringing you truth instead of comfort, but truth which may shatter a lot of the comfort you already feel. For the truth I bring you is simple, incontrovertible, and deadly. It is that unless we can reverse forces which now seem inexorable in their movement, you have only a few more years before the country in which you live will become four separate provinces in a worldwide communist dominion ruled by police state methods from the Kremlin. The map for their division and administration is already drawn. We are living in America today in such a fool's paradise as the people of China lived in 20 years ago, as the people of Czechoslovakia lived in a dozen years ago, as the people of North Vietnam lived in six years ago, as the people of Iraq lived in only two years ago, and as the people of Cuba lived in only yesterday. To illustrate and support this statement, I'm going to ask you to look for a little while with me at some tedious and perhaps even painful history. For as George Santayana so brilliantly pointed out, those who will learn nothing from history are condemned to repeat it. The Cold War in which we are engaged is certainly no game. It is a fatal struggle for freedom against slavery, for existence against destruction. But we can use the analogy of a game nevertheless and I want to show you, right on the clear record about which there can be no reasonable argument, how far that game has progressed and what the score is today. To do that, we must go back to 1917, when the contest started. In that year, Lenin was able, with Trotsky and only a few hundred followers, to take the Russian Revolution out of the hands of its earlier leaders and to convert it into a communist strike for power. In 1918, they established some degree of stability and recognition for their rule by the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Germany. And by 1922, they had extended their infiltration, terror, and control enough to establish the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They were able to bring into this USSR, besides the greatly reduced Russia proper, left them at the time of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, the further areas of Russian Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Ukraine, and Belarusia. And this combination was the base from which Lenin and his successors set out deliberately and determinedly to conquer the world. Lenin died in 1924, but before he died, he had laid down for his followers the strategy for this conquest. It was, we should readily admit, brilliant, far-seeing, realistic, and majestically simple. It has been paraphrased and summarized as follows. First, we will take Eastern Europe. Next, the masses of Asia. Then we shall encircle that last bastion of capitalism, the United States of America. We shall not have to attack. It will fall like overripe fruit into our hands. 
to make doubly clear what he meant and how firmly he meant it with regard to taking Asia ahead of Western Europe and then using Asia as a stepping stone and base from which to conquer Western Europe and the rest of the world, the strategy was also stated that for the communists, the road to Paris led through Peking and Calcutta. Today, you can easily see how that road to Paris is leading back from Peking through Calcutta, Cairo, Damascus, Baghdad, and Algiers. Now, gentlemen, there are many remarkable things about that three-step strategy, but the most remarkable is that the communists have never wavered from it one iota in the 35 years since it was promulgated. Through famines, which they deliberately caused in order to collectivize agriculture, through whatever industrialization they have achieved, through wars which they have cleverly and cold-bloodedly brought on and prolonged for the help of such wars in their plans, through periods of peace and prosperity elsewhere in the world, through power struggles within the Kremlin itself, through apparent changes and reversals in the party line that make non-communist heads swim in confusion, through every upheaval and opportunity, the communists have always kept their eyes unwaveringly on this strategy and on plans to carry it out. They've let nothing stand in their way and nothing divert them. Now, they've used the philosophy of socialism as an ideological weapon in this struggle whenever they could and for whatever it was worth. But it was only one of their many weapons. They have also used bribery, lies, bluff, brutality, the countless tentacles of treason, murder on a scale never before dreamed of in the world, and every possible means to advance them on this road without the slightest concern for any moral difference in those various means. And above all, they have used patience. A patient gradualism has been the most important key to the communists' overwhelming success. Now, the first great break for the communist conspiracy came in 1933 with our formal recognition of Stalin's regime. At that time, the Russian government was staying alive financially from week to week by means which, method switch, in the case of individuals, would be called check kiting. Our recognition tremendously increased their prestige and credit at home and with other nations. It saved them from financial collapse and it enabled them greatly to increase their nests of spies and propaganda agents in this country and elsewhere in the world. Their second break came with the beginning of World War II, which was largely brought on through the worldwide diplomatic conniving of Stalin's agents for the advantage of making Russia a wartime ally of the Western nations and for the sake of chaos and resulting opportunities the war would provide. And anybody who doubts that statement hardly needs to study anything more than the incredible ramifications and accomplishments of just the sword spy ring to discover its truth. With the war once underway, Stalin was able, through the influence of his agents in foreign countries, including our own, to keep the eyes and the anger of the civilized world focused on the crimes of Hitler, while he himself was perpetrating conquest and crime continuously and successfully that far outdid even Hitler's dreams. But in this progress, Stalin always kept his aim exactly on the goals set forth by Lenin. And the tallies of his advance now begin to flash on this scoreboard of ours thick and fast. In August 1939, as a result of his temporary compact with Hitler, Stalin seized all of eastern Poland. During that same year and in 1940, through brutal conquest by force of arms, which his agents in Western countries were able to get the Western nations completely to ignore, he took over the Korean Isthmus of Finland and swallowed up all of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Now it's true that most of these conquests were temporarily taken out of his hands by the Germans during the World War that immediately followed. But they reverted to him as the Germans were driven back in 1944. And although the war had supposedly been fought, in the beginning anyway, over the territorial integrity of Poland and other small nations, the communist influence among the Western allies was so great that as early as the Tehran Conference in 1943, it was made clear